Yeah, my my last name sometimes it's kind of hard to pronounce, isn't it? But uh, it's okay. I'm used to it. For years and years, I've been called all sorts of things. Uh, my pastor down in Virginia, he had a hard time. He just ended up calling me Swindler. So, <laughs> so uh, well, I was John John Swindler uh, for a long time to him. But uh, he he knew he was he was just pulling my leg, and I knew that too. But uh, it's good to be here. Amen. And I thank the Lord for another opportunity to worship our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, together as a church family, uh, to come to, well, just to be in the Word of God, to encourage one another, to fellowship with one another, and to pray for one another, and have a desire for the lost to be saved. And um, I want to encourage all of you, uh, if you haven't been coming to Sunday school, I'm going to encourage all of you to you know give some consideration to start attending Sunday school because uh, it's a really good blessed time um, we're getting uh, we studied just a little bit of Philippians chapter 2 um, and had some great discussion and application some thoughts towards that and you're only going to benefit from it uh, so you know you could eat your cereal a little bit earlier in the morning uh, you know put the Cheerios uh, aside and you know uh, power drink your coffee and, uh, and, and if you can't do that, you can certainly come because there is eggs and cake and bread and toast and coffee and with all the cream and fixings sitting in the back. So I want to encourage you with all that. Well, we're in Philippians chapter 1 again today as we continue on making our way into the book of Philippians. And I want to remind you that Philippians is a beautiful book to a church that uh, really exemplified the Lord Jesus Christ and had an attitude of joy within it. And not only was the attitude or the theme of joy within that church, they were rejoicing and it spilled over into uh, others around them. The Apostle Paul, even though he was in prison in Rome at that time, was a man with joy when he remembered this church. Joy filled his heart. Uh, can you imagine that now? Here you are in a prison 2,000 years ago. Now think about that. There's, it's not a prison like you have today. Uh, there really wasn't the hot meals and a TV to watch when you're bored or whatever it is. This is a stone-cold uh, uh, atmosphere, and, and prisoners were highly, highly frowned upon and mistreated and here was letter getting to the apostle paul from uh from one of the disciples about the church at philippi and when paul heard of the news of that church he with joy in his heart wrote this this letter to them and uh, it's a blessed letter and when we had been studying uh this text we've been studying uh, a number of things of course on the theme of of joy uh, if you remember the first uh, sermon about uh, this text, we, we studied the theology of, uh, the, the theology of joy. Uh, what does the scripture say about joy and such? And then we see in the first five verses that we've been looking at for the last couple weeks now, we've covered a couple elements of joy uh, in that we saw that one of the elements of joy is that it's personal uh, you see that in uh, the text before us in the, in verse uh, we see in um, uh, in verse one he says paul and timothy servants of christ jesus to all the saints in christ jesus who were at philippi with the overseers and deacons grace and peace and from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here when Paul now identifies who he, his, who he is, that he is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a, 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 a slave to the Lord. He's given himself over to the Lord. And then he qualifies or he is given the qualification of being a saint along with those believers that are at Philippi. They're saints because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not self-ordain themselves to be saints, but this is a title and position given uh, to Christians. If you were saved, you were a saint in Christ. 
And then he says, uh, he says with overseers and deacons, he's specifically uplifting to that church and saying, here are the men that are within that church. They're to be the, the overseers. They're, they're the men to, to know scripture. They're men to help protect and feed the flock of God. And Paul, who was just a, an example of examples of a pastor, he knows full well that this church is a healthy church. And of course, in his greeting, he, he starts off with this, grace to you. And what is that grace? It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ going to, to the cross of Calvary and dying for us. For by grace are you saved through faith. And then once we are reconciled to God, we have peace with him, don't we? You see, peace always follows grace. Peace never comes before grace because we need the grace of God before we can know the peace of God. And here is Paul reaching out to them and saying, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God. And herein is one of the first elements of, of, joy, uh, of, of joy is having that personal relationship uh, with God that he says in verse 3, my God, it, this is uh, possessive. This is Paul being adopted into the family of God. This is someone who now can cry out, Abba, Father. And so when we re uh, studied this, we saw that the, one of the elements of joy is that it is personal. It is something that can be adapted and, and possessive to you. And it is knowing the one true living God. To know him and to learn of him. And then we also saw later on in, in this text, we saw that another element of joy is prayer. That communion with God on behalf of others. That you were uh, thankful and you have joy that you're actually able to out to not only know him but you're actually able to commune with the lord and speak to him and give your concerns and praise uh, to him on behalf of other people so this is another element of joy that paul expresses in this letter at the very beginning and then the third element of joy that we saw was the element of being a participant in the advancement of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we spoke at a little bit at length uh, uh, last week about being a participant, being of that fellowship, of actually seeing and wanting the gospel of Jesus Christ to not only reach Denville, but we want it to reach our county. We want it to reach our state, and we want it to reach our nation, and we want the world to know Jesus Christ. And here it is that that church at Philippi was a church that participated not only in just reaching their town with the gospel, but they reached their communities outside of themselves as well. And I uh, wanted to make sure that that is, a, that is an element of joy that you're actually participating in evangelistic work. And we see now today that uh, we're going to be looking at the fourth, uh, or we'll be looking at the fourth element of joy, and that's in the joy of anticipation. So if you will, with me, starting in verse 3, we'll read on through verse 6. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And this, in verse 6, is where the sermon will come from today. And I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here to worship you. As people, Lord, who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, our Savior, Lord, we are joyfully gathering together, Lord, hungering and thirsting for your word, for your righteousness. And Father, we come together, Lord, hungering souls, Lord, wanting to be, wanting to be fed from heaven, 
And I ask, O oh Lord, in your kindness and your mercy, would you feed your sheep? I ask, Father, that you'd give me the wisdom to teach, to preach. I pray, Father, for the filling of your Holy Spirit by, for not only myself, O oh God, but wisdom and the filling of your Holy Spirit to every individual who is listening to your word this morning. Father, make your word alive into our hearts, O God. Fan the flame within us so that the world will know that we are followers of your Son and that when the world looks upon us, dear Lord, that they would see a people that has joy of Christ within them for the reasons of Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless your word this morning. Praise your holy name, our living God and King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is our text, isn't it? Verse 6. And when we look at verse 6 today, we, we have to, of course, keep it, we must keep it linked together with the prior verses. We always have to have that context. When we look at this text, we, we link it to verse 5. Verse 5, because of your partnership in what? The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus came into this world to do what? To save sinners. That's the purpose why he came. And as a, as a result of him saving sinners, God is glorified. He is magnified. He is worshipped. He is loved. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us and gave himself for us. Here is the gospel that Paul says to them, I thank God that you are participants in that gospel. Not only in sharing the gospel by giving out gospel tracts, by speaking by word and, and by mouth to, to others around you, but you are living in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are living in the gospel. That Christ's life that he lived, that Christ's uh, uh, death on the cross and the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, every aspect of him is being seen in you. And Paul is, is closely linking uh, ultimately that, that verse 5 to verse 6 where that gospel is the core of life. As he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until even now. That the heartbeat that you have going on in your chest, the gospel just did not stop when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ at salvation. The gospel is a living gospel. The gospel is life itself. And so every day that we live, where do we live? We live at the footsteps, at the base of the gospel of the cross of Christ. And so here Paul is now saying, with that gospel, because of your partnership in that gospel, from the first day that you were born again into his kingdom, and, ta and even now, whether it's 20 years, 15, or 50 years later, even until now, you are partnering, partnering in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How you work, how you live, how you play, how you speak. What you see, what you do, what you don't do is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul now closely says in verse 6, For I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work. And where was that good work that Paul is giving reference to? It's the death of Christ on the cross. The moment that he has died for your sins and you have believed on him with all of your heart, herein is that good work of God begun in you now. And that good work even continues on to this very day, my friends. 
brethren, all of us here at, in Denville, do you understand this? That the gospel of Jesus Christ is continuing on in your very life, even as we speak to this moment. And so that when you go to work and when you, when you raise your children or when you speak to your children, whatever it may be, the gospel is your life. You pro proclaim it. And here we see that this is closely linked with one another. The gospel is the work of God. Now, when we go to work or play, whatever it may be, that Christ is known, how we live, and how Jesus Christ exemplified himself to us to this very day, it is because of the gospel. Because, let's think about it. Because without God working, Without God sending his son to the cross to die for us, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins, aren't we? We have no hope and without God in this world. So that work that he has done at sending his son to die for each and every one of us, that work of God has begun. Now, not only did Paul uh, now we see that the Apostle Paul tells us why that this joy that he has is flourishing in him. Because he anticipates that God is going to do, or God has begun a work and continues to work. Here is point number one, my friends. The joy of the Lord as his in, is in the anticipation of him working. That work began in the gospel. And he continues to work in the life of you and in the life of others. Are you thankful for Jesus Christ? Are you thankful that he died for you? Are you thankful, my dear friends? Because there's one thing that we always must remind ourselves as we live in our flesh on this earth is that we always must return our minds and our hearts to the person of Jesus Christ himself. If you remember in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, listen to these words. I've shared them before, probably um, even last week, but remember these words. Therefore, in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let, also, uh, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see what the Hebrew writer is saying here. He's saying, yes, we know that the old man and the old nature is always there. He's like a belt strapped around us. He just doesn't leave, does he? However, the writer is giving the relation of life living as something as to what a race is. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And now here he gives the example, more, uh, uh, the example for us as to what we ought to be looking to. And uh, we mentioned this in, um, in Sunday school of, of setting our affections. Where are we to look for? We are to look at Colossians chapter 3. Look to the heavens where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Set your affections on things above, right? So we are to be a people of the kingdom. And here the writer of Hebrews, he says, now the life that you have, you live it like you're running a race. The competition is there always, even until the day of Christ. But I want you, he says, to run with endurance. That endurance is something with the joy of the Lord within it. Endurance, run the race that is set before you in here, looking. So when you live your life, you are looking somewhere. When you're running a race, when you think about people who are running the Olympics or go to the high school track, and you see the 100-meter dash, that 100-meter dash, well, you know the goal is 100 meters away, 
or 400 meters or, or one mile, whatever it is, but you know that that's where the end of it is and that's where the reward is. And here the, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, the life that you have now in this flesh, look forward. And when you are looking forward, you are looking to the person of Jesus Christ himself. He is the ultimate ends of all means. He is our life. So here is the joy that the life that I have now, I, that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And he continues on to say, looking to Jesus the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And here's this word coming. Who? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's victory, isn't it? That's a victorious race but also look at the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all ways and yet never sinned. He was accused, he was mocked, he was hated, and yet he never fell victim to them. He stood victorious as the Son of God and he willingly gave himself to go to the cross of Calvary to take our depraved sin upon himself. In his humanity, he died on the cross, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then the writer says, who for the joy that was set before him endured it. You know what the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ was? Is that there is the cross he knew the punishment. He was going to take the wrath of God the Father. The cup of God's wrath is about to be poured out on his dear son. He took it for us as the Lamb of God. And he was joyful with that in his mind. Why? Because he knew as the result of his death. He knew at the result of his death and his burial, and in his glorious resurrection, life is given. He knew that because of those things, and because of him going to the cross, the result of it is God being loved, God being, being praised, God being honored and worshipped, if he would only go to the cross to which he did. Are you thankful? That now that you had that relationship, Paul is equally saying, because of the gospel and your participation in it, my dear friends, I thank my God. And this is why he goes on, and I'm sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it on to the day of Christ. My dear friends, joy is because of Christ and Christ going to the cross and doing the finished work of salvation. It is on that cross where he cried out, It is finished. The veil opened up, tore from top to bottom, and the holies of holies is exposed. And now there is access by the one true high priest, the one true mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, wherein we have one mediator now between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus our Lord. And joy ought to fill the heart of the believer if we would only look to Christ. So confidence is, is in, er, I'm sorry, uh, 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 when we look at verse 6, we see point number one, confidence in growing in the Lord and not in yourself. We always want to get better, don't we? You know, when I was in, uh, in school, uh, uh, you know, I enjoyed sports just like a, a lot of athletes and stuff. And, and I, 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 I found myself finding confidence in myself to accomplish things. Well, we know that confidence can be quite prideful, can it? 
you know, but we understand that. Ultimately, you should be giving thanks to God for what he has allowed you to do. Whether you're a good athlete or just a mediocre one, you give God the glory for it. But we know that Paul uses this in verse 1 because he says, and I am sure, or he is, I have confidence in this. Paul's hope is not, is not prideful in any way as looking to himself in some way. I'm confident myself that God's going to work. No. He's just happy. You know, Paul would be appreciative to even be used of God, to be a pastor of a church, to even to be used of God in any aspect. Sister, you play the piano, you're used of God with the ministry he has given you. So the, the ministry we have is all for God's glory, is it not? That everything that we have, even if you're a husband, even if you're a, just a son or a daughter, if you've been saved, you look to Christ and every aspect of your life is going to be used for his glory. Give him the thanks for that. Paul's confidence is in God's faithfulness to fulfill his will in the lives of others. That's what this text speaks of. Paul's confidence is that holiness is developing in others. You know, when he's praying, he says, I thank my God in all remembrance of my prayers of you. You know what he's saying? I thank God that you are growing in holiness. I thank God that you are growing in sanctification, that the Lord is developing you from the first day until now. When you were first born again, you are now growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life exemplifies the Son of God. And it's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul is acknowledging this. We must remember that Paul is speaking to Christians here, not to the, uh, the lost world. So my question to you is this. Have you had problems with other Christians? Okay, here comes application time. Because there are problems with other Christians. Paul writes to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are an, a prime example of a, what kind of, of a church really not to be like. Even though that they're in the New Testament, you know, it's not like it's the church of Denville here that he's writing to. No, it's the Corinthian church. And, and there's a lot of what not to be like in, the, in the, the Paul's epistles to the Corinthians. However, when you read the Philippians, there's a great amount of, of what it's like to be a great church but also Paul remembers that there are two women in that church who don't get along with one another. And he says to, to uh, he, he'll speak to them in a, uh, in, uh, later on in the text, where he says, listen, brother, and I'm assuming in that text, he's actually speaking to one of the pastors of the church when he says, listen, brother, or, or my companion, please speak to, to, to these two ladies and help them resolve their issue. Now, what their issue was, don't know. But it obviously was enough of a schism for Paul to hear of it in Rome. And he just simply put out that sentence. And in that sentence, he is trusting the pastors of that church to wipe it out and make sure that conflict would be annihilated. Because we know that if there's any type of schism within a church, it kind of has a ripple effect, doesn't it? As silent as, as, as it may be, as invisible in, in as it may be, we may not see it, but yet it's in the hearts that get affected, doesn't it? And that schism is what can cause division within churches, and that is not the will of God. So what about when Christians arise? Because many times we will, you know, separate ourselves. Listen, I've been part of that myself too. I've you know, we've burned other people, and other people have burned us. Well, if we have done it, we ought to look in the mirror, shouldn't we? And repent. And use that as a time of, Lord, please forgive me for that. Christ is not glorified in it. But yet, 
the Lord allows those times to purify us, to, to grow us in, in sanctification, doesn't it? Paul says, I thank God of, every, of all my remembrance of you. He is thanking God for the holy work of God in their life, even until that day. And we ought to be a people of that same attitude as well. So that when we do notice that when we look in the mirror, that maybe the problem is me. That we would snub out that sinful pride with repentance. And remember the book of 1 John. 1 John is, is a book written to Christians. And, and the Apostle John wrote that book with the intention of keeping fellowship with the brothers and sisters. But ultimately, keeping fellowship. Not separation in a point that you lose your salvation. No, that's not the, that's not the case. But we, we kind of lose a little bit of that, that joy and that comfort with the Lord, don't we? We grieve the Holy Spirit the Bible speaks of. You know, when uh, my daughter does something that's, that's wrong when she doesn't listen to mom and dad, and mom and dad gets upset, what happens? Well, she doesn't lose her relationship. She will forever be my daughter. And I will forever love her. But there's a little schism going on there, and she needs a little chastisement, doesn't she? To bring her back into order as a good child. And that's the way it is with God's people and him. He will ch chastise his people like a loving father, doesn't he? Why? To bring us to that repentance and to bring us back into that joyful fellowship and walk with him again. That's why we see that accountability to each other as a church is so vital. You know, in Matthew chapter 18, I want you to listen to these words. This is Jesus speaking about how to have discipline with one another as believers in a church. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Do you see the accountability here? Do you see the, the purpose of, of unity here? That you have gained that brother. He's back in that sweet fellowship where both of you now still have your eyes focused in that race for the end purpose. Jesus Christ, brother, it's all for him. And now he continues on. He says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him, to, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And so there is the accountability for one another. The Jesus is speaking to his disciples here of we are to have our eyes fixed upon him for the purpose of God's glory. Paul's remembrance of this church was a church that was participants in the gospel. We must remember Christ. We must remember what he has done for us. Because when we remember him, where does that keep us? It, keep us, it keeps us at the base of the cross, doesn't it? It reminds us of who we are and who he is. And Lord, all my life that I have, I want to bring honor and glory to him. As often as I fail him, he's still graceful to us, isn't he? And welcoming. So we see that confident is, is knowing that God is doing a work. And that work is a godly work. That work is a good work. When you pray for others, you, Paul was blessed to know that God was working in those Philippian people from the day that they were saved, even until the day that he's writing that letter, he is praising God for that holy, good, righteous work that God is doing. Are you thankful that God works in other people? So that when you do have those schisms that may arise, do you understand that God has allowed that time to come up that you are now going to understand that God is using that to help that other person too. You know, hey, you know, we've all had our backs stabbed, but do you pray for those who have done it? 
And do you pray for them? I mean, if they're, if they're truly Christians and they have used you in some way, which they probably shouldn't do, but yet, you know, they do it. Why? Because that old nature is still tied to us, isn't it? Like that belt. And so when the words rear up and the, and the accusation may come or whatever it may be, do you turn it to the Lord? Father, I'm looking at the word of God and I want the reward of God to reflect back to me who I am. I want to see who I am. Maybe it's my fault why that happened. Maybe it's not. Whatever it is, repentance, self-evaluation, and casting all your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. You are giving them to him. And here is that joy that Paul has, is that he's knowing that God is working in them. And when he mentions, his, mentions these two ladies who have a problem within the church, he is entrusting that the work of God is going to work in those ladies. By using this brother to come to them and say, help them out. Help counsel them. And Paul is confident that the work of God is going to work. Well, when we read in these texts following, we see that confident, confident joy is knowing that God is working. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 3, Paul says to the Galatians, Oh, foolish Galatians. You know, hey, that's how he's speaking to the church. You see that? Hey, listen here, you knuckleheads. <laughs> When somebody calls me a knucklehead, my ears perk up because, like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so he's probably he's probably speaking Galatian language right there. <laughs> oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this: Do you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul is saying to them, he says, listen, are you, uh, is it because of what you're doing that's making you holy? Or is it the work of God that's making you holy? Paul's trying to bring it home to the Galatians to help them understand that it is the good work of God that is that that is going to help them walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes off on to the Ephesians, and he says this, And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice he says, you were in a position. Your position is that you were dead. Now, you're, you say, well, I'm alive. No, you're spiritually dead without Christ before God. And you're, you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which uh, you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, wrath like the rest of mankind. I love verse 4. But God, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, and here's the work of God, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And that's why Paul, when he writes to the Philippians and he uses that word, it's because by we are saved by grace and peace from God the Father. That's when it all comes together. And Paul, even writing to the Ephesians, as he wrote to the Galatians, it is the Holy Spirit work of God in your life. You don't do it. It is God that's doing his good work. And then in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, he came unto his own, and his own people did not receive him, speaking of the Lord. But to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. My dear friends, it was God who began the good work in Lydia. Remember when we read Acts chapter 16? In Acts chapter 16 is when you start reading about the history of the beginning church at Philippi. And the very first convert was a woman who was named Lydia. And she was down on the river with all the other ladies. And the Bible says this uh, it, the, in uh, Acts chapter uh, 16, verse 14. One who heard was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart. The Lord. That's the good work, isn't it? That is the work of God from that day that she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ until the very last day that she breathed her last breath. She was being worked on by God. But that good work began at the gospel. For it says this again, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And what it was it that Paul was saying? It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where life begins, doesn't it? And that's where the joy that Lydia had began uh, having the, the confidence of knowing that God was working in her life and the life of others. Why? Because they were participants of the gospel. So when you participate in it, you know that the joy of the Lord is going forth and that God is not only saving them, but they are, there's more people living in the gospel. If you're saved today, if you've been born again, the gospel is not something in the past. The gospel is your life. It's what you live in. And so when we see, now we see that God's work is a good work. As Paul would say in Philippians 2.13, he would say this to them, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure, for his glory, for his good pleasure. He's working in you, brethren. We ought to be joyful in that, that God's working in my very life if I simply have my face and my heart fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. His work on the cross is perfect, making us saints. The work that he has done is taking place. Where, or where was it taking place? It began on the cross. And now at work, the, the work of God continues on in every aspect of our life. Notice where he says where it works in verse 6. I am sure of this thing, that he who has begun a work, where? In you. That's personal, isn't it? He's speaking to the person. Brother, sister, I'm thankful for what God is doing in you. He's not just saying, I'm thankful for God, what he's doing in me, so listen to my story. <laughs> no, he's thankful for what's happening in the life of others. And here is a joyful attitude of someone who is joyful in the work of God in the lives of other people. Are you thankful for this church? Are you thankful for, for the people within this church? Any troublemakers? <laughs> Repent. But are you thankful to see that there are people growing in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what encourages me as a pastor? And, and Paul can say that Paul has said this in the scriptures and Paul is uh, he spoke to the Thessalonians about how much joy they bring to him to be a pastor to them. Why? Because they are growing in God. That's the heart of a pastor, is to see God's sheep growing under their shepherd. And I'm talking about the shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul is, is adamant about it. He says, I'm happy to know that, that you are growing in him. In you, God is working. As I read this psalm, uh, last night, I, I wanted to place that within this, this text. 
because in Psalm 138, verses 1 through 8, you can turn there if you want. It's eight verses, but listen closely as the psalmist writes. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Do you see what the psalmist is saying just in verse 2? He says, I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for what? For your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted, uh, for you have exalted above all all things, your name and your word. God is a faithful God. We have a, in our hymnal books, we have a hymn. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning after morning, your mercies are renewed. Great are your, is your thankfulness. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of, a tro of trouble, you preserve my life. You see the good work of God. You preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purposes for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. He's saying, Lord, you are faithful. Your everlasting love, you're kind and merciful. Your hand has been upon my life. Can you say that? Can you honestly say that in your life? The Lord has, has always met your need. He has always been there. He's never backtracked on you. Yes, we fall into our, our pits. We fall into our temptations. But it's the Lord who's faithful to nothing. He's faithful to his good work. He's faithful for his glory. And then we see here in, in Lamentations chapter 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So my dear friends, God's work at salvation gives us joy that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I remember the words of Romans chapter 8, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation Will, able, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you thankful for his faithfulness? We should be thankful and joyful that he is a faithful God. He's joy, uh, we ought to be joyful because he is faithful to his purposes and in his work. And of course, I remember as now what Paul goes on to say in verse 6, For I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is faithful to make sure that he will finish his work. Even up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes back, he is continuously being faithful to his will. Are you joyful in that? Are you joyful that you have the word of God? That God is not changing? You get married, you get married, and what happens? You find out that the person you're marrying, they change sometimes, don't they? Or sometimes we want to change the person, <laughs> and sometimes they don't, do they? 
But the great thing about it is that we know the Lord Jesus Christ and He does not change. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The book of Malachi says, I am the Lord, I change not. Thank God for that. That He is a merciful, loving Father and He's begun a good work in you. And He will complete His work in you with His mercy and His love to you. He will do it until he brings his son back to earth. I'll read these texts here. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers. For that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake as, and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love, and of a helmet of the hope of salvation. That's where it all began, wasn't it? That salvation. That the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or whether we asleep, we might live, we might live with Him. Therefore, and here's, I love this word, encourage. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. As, as Paul wrote to these Thessalonians, he is making the implications to which he just mentioned that God has begun a good work in you. I am confident of this. It'll be, it began at the day of salvation and he'll bring it to pass until the day of Christ. And he says it to the Thessalonians, encourage one another in this. Have your joy in this. Build one another up as what you are doing. And what he is encouraging them is saying, let the word of God continue to work in your very lives. And it is also the apostle Peter who wrote, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done all will be exposed. Since all these things are thus uh, to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening to the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as, as they burn. But according to his promises, we are waiting for that new heaven and that new earth in which righteousness dwells. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, at the race that now we have set before us, Christ is the goal. As what Solomon said at the end of his life, here is the conclusion of all the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Love him and give thanks to him with a joyful heart. First of all, for saving you. And second of all, blessing you with his Holy Spirit, helping you live a life of the gospel. The gospel is just a, not a one-time thing. It is forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the deepness and the richness of your word. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit has spoken to these dear people. And I pray, Lord, from my heart to you, O God, continue your wonderful work in their lives. I bless you, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Swingle. And um, yes, uh, thank you for uh, sharing what the Holy Spirit put on your heart and through the Holy Spirit today. Uh, I think it was a, you know, uh, my hope is uh, that, you know, for this week, for us, myself, that we'll continue to, uh, in our studies later today and even the other days during the week, that we'll look through the book of Philippians here that we'll share a little what we learned today with some people that we run into this week. It'll be a, a wonderful thing to share our hope that we have. Um, thank you so much for that message. And um, I think we have a, a closing hymn, number 712, 710, you're right. Jesus, lover of my soul, verse 1. First verse. Everybody rise. Thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've brought us here together. I pray for you, Father, to bless us as we leave here, that we may be out there for you, Father, and we will share the knowledge of you in these coming days. Thank you so much for all your, your care and mercy that you have bestowed on us. In your Son's name, amen. Thank you, everybody, and we'll be glad to see you here um, next week for Bible study. <laughs>